Well, Barry uh, started working on this topic at least three or four years ago, and there have been a series of papers, first with uh, Burke, and then more recently with um, Bertless and Zhang. Um, Zhang is now Gia Natasio. Um, and I've followed this literature, this series of papers closely, and I'm a big fan. I think it's uh, very valuable work. <clears throat> And I recently was uh, co-chairing a National Academy of Sciences panel <clears throat> looking at the growing gap in life expectancy and its implications for uh, government programs. And we uh, drew heavily on uh, the earlier work, the Bosworth and Burke uh, work in structuring our analysis. So uh, I think it's great. And uh, now to put this in a bigger context, uh, yes, they're big differentials by socioeconomic status, and yes, these are growing wider. Uh, we have many, many studies now for the U.S. that are confirming these findings. Um, but there's also growing evidence internationally uh, for both of these things. And for example, there was a recent study uh, in Chile showing not only these differentials, but there's been a big widening of the mortality differentials. And OECD is putting out a report that finds widening differentials in many OECD countries. So uh, this isn't a universal phenomenon, but it is a very widespread phenomenon. Why is it happening and where is it going uh, is a very important question, I think. And two smaller sub-questions. Uh, is this a longitudinal? Uh, phenomenon? Is this reflecting changes, you know, differences in uh, childhood long ago, or is this a period phenomenon that uh, uh, has been happening in certain calendar years? Um, another question is, we know that income distributions are widening. Uh, mortality distributions by income are widening. Is, one, is the widening income distribution driving the widening mortality distribution? Well, we don't know. And the way many of the analyses are structured, we can't even ask the question, unfortunately. Uh, OK. So um, one of the difficulties uh, that affects particularly these longitudinal studies, um, uh, Waldron's original study, the ones Barry's been doing, the NAS study, is that typically we you know, we don't observe a generation until it's entirely died out. We have uh, mortality observations maybe truncated at uh, age 50 or 60 or 80 or something like that, and we want to say something about life expectancy and we have to project. Well, in the case of um, this, this paper on SIP, for example, for the 1990 birth cohort, uh, only 19% of the females uh, had died by 2012. And if we look at the top uh, decile of earners for females, well, only about 13% of them had died 2012 by the end of the data. The rest of it is projection and extrapolation. That is, almost all of the deaths are projection and extrapolation. Uh, and I shouldn't be complaining about this because in the National Academy study, we focused on the 2060, uh, 1960 cohort for which we had zero deaths, <laughs> and it was entirely projection. Okay, anyway, this is a, an issue. And, um, well, we can ask how good is this projection on average? Well, we compare it to uh, Social Security actuaries. For males, it's very similar if we look at cohort mortality. For females, it's somewhat different uh, for whatever uh, reason. The, uh, the BBG uh, projections of the cohort after we average out the income differences are rather, uh, see rather larger gains than the actuaries do. Uh, now, there's another problem that sort of interacts with this first one, which is that in most of our analyses, are, uh, hours I'm referring to this literature in general, the statistical models are assuming 
that the differential mortality, uh, at least proportionally, is the same across the whole life cycle, acro across all ages. But at the same time, uh, lots of studies conclude that mortality differentials by income or SES narrow as people get older. So this is from the uh, appendix of the longer report that the BBG paper uh, is drawing on. And these are the ratios of mortality for the lower income group to the higher income group. So these are ratios are like in the range 2.2, 2.5, 2.6 up here at age 50, and by the time you get up to age 80, they're down close to one. And that's for men and similarly for females. And uh, Raj Chetty, I asked him about his study. Yes, they find something similar, and it's out there in the literature. Well, when we observe the, let's see, if we, if we look at people who were born longer ago, in this longitudinal context, if we look at people who were born longer ago, they are older during our period of observation now. They're at older ages. So we're assessing their mortality differentials at ages in which those differentials may be much smaller just because of life cycle factors. And when we look at um, younger or later born cohorts, we're assessing them at younger ages when the mortality differentials are bigger. And our models assume that it doesn't matter when we look at it. We can estimate those differentials at any age because they're the same. Well, OK, so this, I, I've worried about this a lot in the National Academy work. And I haven't seen a lot of discussion. But uh, fortunately, I mean, you could make a case, ah, this is the whole thing. There's nothing going on. But uh, fortunately, we also have these cross-sectional studies, like Raj Chetty's uh, and many others, that show a very powerful set of mortality differentials and very powerful widening. And so I think the combination of the longitudinal analysis and the cross-sectional analysis is very uh, persuasive. Um, OK, now I want to show some comparisons of the results of the BBG uh, paper with the National Academy study I mentioned. Uh, this is the study is called The Growing Gap in Life Expectancy by Income and its uh, implications for government programs or something like that. Uh, you can find it online if you're interested. And there were, we, we drew heavily on the earlier Bosworth Burke work in structuring it, but, uh, but there are differences in what we did also, and particularly in relation to what we heard just now, because we used HRS, we wanted that, uh, health, disability, and so on, information in addition to everything else. But this SIP is a much bigger data set and has money. Anyway, so that's a difference. The comparison of birth years is different. This is 1920 to 1940. We did 1930 versus 1960 for various reasons. We used uh, income quantiles, well, quintiles in our case, uh, as our explanatory variable. Uh, BBG is using a continuous uh, measure, which I really like, and the differences in the statistical model and so on. All the same, um, I've sort of, let's just focus on this uh, little table here. I've, I've adjusted for the 30-year span versus a 20-year span and so on, and just looked at the rate of widening of the dispersion of mortality by uh, income. And from, in the BBG study for men, it's widening at 0.28 years per calendar year. And for females, at 0.25 years per calendar year. This is for the gap at life expectancy at age 50. And in the NAS study, it's by 0.27 and 0.32. Very, very similar. And in fact, if I remember right, those are very similar to the kinds of numbers that Raj Chetty showed yesterday as well. There's a lot of consistency here. I'd say surprising consistency, given the differences in approach. Um, now, if we look at the impact on lifetime benefits, uh, OK, what I'm showing here is the change in, well, let's say the change in progressivity, the change in uh, lifetime benefits in dollars that comes about just because of the widening mortality difference. 
So in BBG, here we're looking at Social Security, which means OASDI, old age, uh, benefits, survivors, and disability. Um, it gets $83,000 less progressive uh, for men and $47,000 less progressive for females. And in the NAS, where I think uh, also, we also have SSI folded in there, it gets 70,000 less progressive and 48,000 less progressive. I think that's a really amazingly close agreement. And then in the NAS study, we were also doing Medicare and Medicaid and taking into account uh, utilization and health costs and so on. And that bumps these up to 132,000 for men and 157,000 for women. So there's a big swing in the progressivity of our major uh, government transfer programs here. I think it's quite important. Uh, OK. Yeah, OK. So here is one point at which um, I disagree um, a bit with the specification strategy in the BBG uh, study. Uh, if what we are mainly interested in is the interaction of the mortality differentials with the, say, Social Security system, then I don't think we want to include other variables in the regression, like race, ethnicity, education, disability, uh, marital status, and so on. I think we just want income, age, sex, and year of birth. Um, we don't care whether someone is poor and has uh, uh, high mortality because they're black, because they have low education, because they're divorced. All we care about is whether they both have uh, low income and low uh, life expectancy. So um, I think there's a, a risk of um, you know, sort of missing some of the covariance of income and, and mortality that is relevant for that question when you include these covariants. Now, Barry was just explaining that when you do include those variants, you don't really have much effect on the income uh, relationship, uh, which is fine and is consistent with the fact that we find very similar results, as I just showed you. OK. Um, now, last. Do widening income differentials drive widening mortality differentials by quantile? Uh, this is a question I started out with. And because Waldron and the National Academy study, and, and I think the original uh, uh, Bosworth and Burke study, have their income variable be positioned in an income quintile or decile or uh, half of the income distribution, that sort of thing. You can't ask what the effect of a widening income distribution is because the bottom quintile is just the bottom quintile. It's not better or worse over time. You're just at the bottom. It doesn't say how far you are from the mean. But in this study, at least, if, and I'm not sure about the earlier ones, uh, they're measuring the income position uh, as a continuous variable, uh, just a ratio to the mean, as uh, Barry explained a moment ago. And that mean, although they then ex post sometimes convert that to, a quant to quantiles for graphic purposes and so on, the basic analysis is done this way. And it seems to me that means that with this setup, you can ask that question and get an answer to you know, how much effect does the widening of the income distribution have on these mortality differentials? And I would love to uh, see that. And uh, so I think it's a really uh, important question. Now these two literatures are just, they're not really uh, engaged, the income distribution and the uh, mortality distribution. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>